Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Emily Cash with the FreightWaves Media Team, and I'm happy to present this webinar in partnership with DDC FPO. Today, we will discuss how transitioning from manual to digital processes and integrating machine learning and automation can significantly increase operational efficiency. I'm happy to be joined by Richard Greening, Chief Information Officer Global at DDC FPO, and my colleague, Mary O'Connell, author and freight broker expert at FreightWaves. We will also have a live Q&A following discussion, so make sure you have your questions ready for Richard and Mary. Before we get started, I'd like to cover just a couple of housekeeping items. First, if you have any issues during the webinar, please feel free to access the help section in your webinar console. If you have questions that you would like to ask our presenters, please enter those to the Q&A box in your console, and we will answer as many of those as possible during the live audience Q&A following the discussion. We will also be sending a link to the recording of this webinar tomorrow if you'd like to view it on demand or share with your colleagues. And finally, at this point, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Richard and Mary to kick off today's discussion. Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, thank you, Richard, for joining us today. And thank you to all of you guys for joining us. Uh, I am excited to get into this topic. I think we're going to cover a lot of good ground today, Richard, don't you think? I do. And so every time we, we have these discussions, we tend to go slightly off topic. But I always like your take, and it's, uh, it's good fun. Uh, here's hoping today we can stay mostly on topic, um, but I say we just <laughs> dive right in and get into the meat of everything. Okay, oh, so we... introductions first. Go ahead. No, I was, um, okay, well, I guess introductions. So I guess for everyone, I, I give, I'll start with myself. So I'm, as I say, as, uh, as Emily introduced me, I'm Richard Greening. I'm the Chief Information Officer for the DDC Group. Uh, DDC group uh, or DDC stands for direct data capture. That's primarily what we we focus on, and we do we we really focus on back office operations. Um, DDC FPO, which is our flagship brand, primarily focuses on um, freight billing or serving the LTL and truckload industry in the United States of America. Uh, I am Mary O'Connell. Some of you may or may not know. I am our freight, breaker, freight, freight broker expert and cold chain expert here at FreightWaves. Um, and as Richard mentioned, uh, we he has a extensive background in LTL and I do as well. So apologies to those who accidentally get too many LTL examples today. Yeah, no, I, I think Mary, so for everyone that's watching, What's great about today, and I'm going to try and throw it over to Mary rather than just be, because uh, I think Mary can probably give a lot of color because uh, there's pretty much no job you've done. Is that fair in saying when it comes to back office operations in LTL? Unfortunately, that is fair. true. I have done done too much, too much. But let's see how many of those examples we can get in today. <laughs> okay, um, so. So the purpose for this, or I guess from, from our perspective, one of the reasons we were asked to do this is we, we produced a white paper back in April. And I think the, the title of it was The Six Key Ways to Bolster Efficiency. And that got a reasonable amount of traction. Um, so wearing the IT hat, and I'm also responsible for our, uh, our technical roadmap and the development of our products. So, um, and, and we've had a few of those now in the last four or five years that specifically kind of feed into this operation. So that's why I think everyone felt it was relevant for me as we go along, but I'm also gonna talk generically, but obviously I come at things from, from, a, from an IT, from a data governance, and from a IT and operational efficiency piece. Um, so that's really what we're going to we're going to focus on is really those six key points. A lot of them overlap, um, and yeah, uh, you'll you'll see that. But what we're going to try to do when we talk about these different topics is really try and try a different slant so that it sort of gives everyone sort of a, a 3D view. So number one in our white paper was automating routine tasks. Um, so when it comes to automation, um, the best example I normally start with people so we cover everyone on the call. Automation be, can be anything as simple as setting your out of office on your email, all the way to deploying robots in your in, in your warehouse. 
um, and it's, in, it's anything and everything in between. So, you know, it really, it's, ex, it's, it's extensive and there's no real limit to it. But I think what would be useful, Mary, for, is for us to probably give some examples, maybe of the tasks that either you saw automated in your in your in your history, or tasks that you wish were automated. Um, so unfortunately, I had a bad habit of automating myself out of a job, um, <laughs> which I like to think is a good thing to do because you know you go in, you get this really clunky process. Um, so for example, one of my very first days uh, as a operations support person, they sat you down and they said, okay, you're brand new to the company. You have no idea how to do anything. You're going to go ahead and set up a returns process for us. And I said, okay what are returns? What does this look like? And so kind of from there, we were able to take something that was a very clunky process of, okay, I'm going to call and ask how many pallets do you have that you need to bring back? And then I'm going to send out one truck to go pick it up and bring it back. Instead, we were able to kind of develop something that from the people who needed to issue a return, they were able to kind of input how much they had and let us know what it was. And then, then it would automatically build a load in the system. And then send out um, like a load request and we had a carrier that was already matched to it. And cause it was kind of a, it was more of a dedicated network versus a go out and find one. So we were able to automatically match people to it. And basically what would have taken us a week in the past, um, we could get done essentially within an hour and a half of whenever the um, the receiver was like, hey, this is how many returns I have. So we were able to really shorten that process down um, through just something simple as just, you know, a new person coming in and saying, all right, well, we're going to try it this way because what do we really have to lose other than sitting here playing phone tag with people and manually building loads in the system and uh, as we've all done it inevitably in our lives it's not a fun time it's really not fun to sit there and manually enter all the information no absolutely so so some of the examples on screen that came from the white paper the top one you know you start with the business problems before i guess we get into the individual types of issues but poor customer service experience right it's loss of business um is number one so you know there's, there's two kinds of employees that I see, and maybe I'm a bit harsh. You know, there are people that do the job because they're being paid to do the job, and there's people that love what they do. Um, sadly, most of the people I see that are in logistics, um, you just say, one, once you're in, I think you've said it as well, once you're in, it's very hard to get out. Yeah. Um, but two, at the same time, the people that are in it really love it, and they're really passionate about it. You know, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good industry. I came from, uh, I started an air freight originally um, in Europe, because obviously I'm from the UK. Um, and then it was interesting when I got involved within LTL six years ago, um, just the similarities. And it's just good people. So everyone wants to do a good job. And there's all this stuff that goes on behind the scenes that the, the, the end customer, be it if it's the shipper or the consignee, isn't aware of what goes on in order to get their package. And the expectation of that is just getting more and more uh, higher and including the fact that people want more and more visibility. They want to know where those shipments are. So, you know, it's not just the automation. As you say, there's some other examples on here about employee burnout. When it comes to DDC, we have eight and a half, or oh, sorry, 8,200 people and counting uh, in our group across the globe. Um, so we have a lot of key entry staff that deal with a lot of the really complex work still. Um, and a lot of that is really mundane and it leads to employee burnout. So we have to work really hard when, when, when you're just doing the similar tasks time and time again on employee engagement, creating a career progression for them. And that's easier for us being that much smaller carriers across the US specifically. There's not always a next step. So being able to automate tasks for the back office staff. And I think, again, you have to tell me if you agree to this or not, but um, when a biller or anyone in the back office operations complains about something, they tend not really to complain because it's happened once. It's more likely that it's the same thing every day and okay. it's been the same thing every day for the longest time. Is that fair? Yeah, it's definitely a uh, once is like a, huh, that's weird. 
must be something weird. Um, pretty much once you start hitting like five or six times, that's when you're like, okay, we actually need to do something about this. Um, and that literally could be something as simple as like, well, I say simple, but we all know it's not simple. You could have found a problem of, oh, this carrier is sending over this EDI code for this invoice wrong. Well, we need them to change it from uh, our CI and, and we need to change it to SCI or something like that. And it could literally take six months to get one piece, to get one letter change in an EDI code. But in the meantime, that person that's auditing and billing, they have to go through hundreds of invoices a week to potentially manually approve them if they can't get the carrier code sent over correctly. And um, yeah, that's like hours a week that you get to sit there and have the pleasure of manually handling hundreds of invoices on top of everything else. I guess I guess what we're trying to touch on today is the automation stuff and there's stuff that I would call low hanging fruit some people like that term some people don't stuff that you can do really quickly and easy to make someone's life better or improve a process um, or it's the more the more complicated stuff um, that you need to tackle and, and we'll talk about that later on in the in the webinar about tackling IT projects and, and, and those pieces but I guess just to summarize uh, probably on this first point, I say I didn't feel the need to go through everything else that was on the previous slide. Um, I think the examples kind of speak for themselves. But again, this kind of encapsulates a lot of that too, which is the benefits of automation. You know, reducing errors, you know, is good for your employees and morale. It's also good for your customers. You, you know, as you can see there, we're improving CX. It can also improve, you can accelerate your cash flow. I guess one of the things we haven't talked about is, is people getting paid quicker. One of the the challenges in logistics is always getting paid because someone's always out of pocket until the transaction's complete. And we'll touch on that, I guess, in a bit, bit of time too, that to get paid quicker, it's about visibility. And that's one of the keys that's coming up uh, in a bit. And then another one is to maintain business continuity. So it's not something we've really touched on and it's a hard thing to equate. And it's something that we should think about as we talk about all of these, these topics that are coming up. It's, it's very hard to put a process in that may only be needed when something goes wrong. But thinking about that cost when it does go wrong versus what it's costing you as an insurance policy is sometimes hard for people to, to wrap their head around. So I think we've pretty much covered automation. I want to keep this flowing and not lose any of our, our um uh, our, our, our audience but again please questions in the in the in the, um, in the in the in the text box and ask anything and mary's going to carve out enough time to answer or, or me to answer everything you do as you, you go along and that's really the format now i think we're we're going to adopt for the rest of it so one down five more to go <laughs> right second one slight slant on a different uh, on the same thing really so really the difference between integrating or integration and automation um, is I think one of the things we want to sort of cover on. So why integrate? So the obvious thing is kind of like with automation, removing those manual tasks, um, that's key. The, the challenge uh, or the slant I'm gonna put on this slightly differently, which is now I guess more with an IT hat on, which is right Rather than asking your teams or your customers what you could do better, is this is more kind of aimed at the, the you know the supply chain operation operations itself and possibly IT to look at the systems you already have in place and the clients that use AS four hundred terminal based systems, um, and because of that, they think they are stuck in the dark ages. There's a lot of benefits to it. I saw you smile there, Mary. We're going to get on to AS four hundred in a second. So the, um, there's, a, there's a lot of benefits to it. The system works, it's highly reliable. Um, it is, is less susceptible in many ways to cyber security attacks, et cetera. So there's a lot of reasons why businesses aren't making the switch from something they've always known. It's also that they've, um, they have they only know what they know. A lot of the developers that develop those systems, unfortunately, are no longer probably with us. It's also a challenge and getting new people to fill that in, in fill that backstop um, in an environment that's maybe not as cool as some of the other technology you can get involved on in the world is, is a challenge. So they're all of the reasons why, you know, LTL carriers and, and, and truck load carriers are still using AS400. It is still a viable option. Using a system that's possibly 20 or 30 years old, 
that they then can't integrate that with their billing system um, or, or with any other, or, or their dispatch system or their warehouse management system or their customer experience or their um, CRM tool, whatever it is within the business you're trying to operate, they, there may not even been a discussion about how you integrate those things. Would you agree? I think that's a very good point. Um, I mean, as someone who has worked in AS400 and learned that clicking is not an option there, um, it's you definitely feel like it is antiquated. But that being said, like where I was when where the place that I worked at that used it, you know, they had this very fancy dashboard. They had all these great um, what looked like cutting edge technology that they were able to prevent to their present to their customers. And they were able to still meet those technology goals and the reporting aspect and the data aspect that all of the uh, that all of the customers wanted, but they still had it off of AS400. And it was because of those integrations that they had that they were able to, you know, still live with AS400 versus I've also worked with a legacy system that uh, I, I don't know a lot about code developing, but I know that when a developer says it's like spaghetti, that it's not a good idea <laughs> to mix pasta and technology. Um, but that being said, like I've had more issues with a homegrown legacy system versus AS400. And like you mentioned, there aren't people that are like, let's go work on a system. Let's go learn to code and develop a system that is quickly becoming almost obsolete. Um, so it does have its challenges, but those, but those challenges, I feel like people are more ready to jump in because it is more of a challenge versus a spaghetti code of a legacy system. You're kind of just left going, okay, well, it should work maybe, but we're not 100% sure because we built this ourselves of, across like eight developers over three years. So here's hoping it works. Um, or that is that, that just is some of the problems that come with that old legacy system that's homegrown. And you point to that now, I think people are more security conscious. So, you know, when people jumped in and did that sort of thing 10 or even 20 years ago and built it themselves, um, they were unaware of how easy it is or how easy it is to be vulnerable to, to cyber attacks. And I, I certainly know we've seen across some of the clients we serve and, and, and the LTL industry, several cyber attacks in the last uh, 12 months alone of all sizes. So. Again, when you are developing your own systems, and even if you're de developing integrations, often it's the integration that could potentially be the penetration point. So trying to do that stuff yourself without the advice, um, and, and again, even when you do, bringing in external pen testers to ensure that everything you've built is, is, is key in order to get that um, buttoned up and give you peace of mind at, at night. So I guess going into the benefits of integrating, um, you know, the obvious one, better data quality. And, and I think what, what we mean by that is that either you're passing data through natively, and we'll get into structured and unstructured data in a minute. So uh, everyone hold that one if, if you don't quite get what that term means. But if we think about moving data natively, um, also it's it's triggering data to go in in, in, uh, in different ways. So there's a, there's two kind of main ways to integrate, I guess, to give uh, people some examples. There's, you know, there's plenty of others. The, the idea of a point-to-point, -point, you know, this is where if people hear the term a API, what we're doing is we're taking a data set, but let's think of it like a list or a shopping list or whatever you want to call it. And we've got to get it into a system over there in the order in which that system understands it. So what we're really doing is mapping it's called api mapping where we take for example because in the other client system that's the direct connection and when you can make that connection between the two data points again there's no manual intervention this data flow even if it's being reconfigured or restructured and say so we'll talk about structuring uh, a bit later on another example is middleware um, and middleware is a great um, option for people that are are in the world of the AS400 system. So again, there is potential a lot of limit, limitations in what AS or people presume as limitations, but there are a lot of providers out there that have built integrations specifically for those challenges and they can work as, as the middleman. So think of like, like them as the cashier or the, tra or the person that's handling the transaction. So in a way, no different to shopping list one going to shopping list two, but rather than you you writing a direct in integration between you and 
and and you're using a third person so it's like going through a bank is probably one way of, of putting it you're letting someone else handle your money um so there are companies out there that specifically do that for transferring data but often you can find systems that do this so again if it is the um the billing system the dispatch system the warehouse management system they 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 can act as a middleware supplier as well because it's newer technology and they know that you've got these legacy problems so they can provide or be the middleware manager to be then you know the end receiver of the data that, that comes in so it just gives people some thought about again when we go back to talking about automation automation as we said can be anything from the email all the way through to the robots um, and that also includes the the integration that, that, that can go on too, because again, we're just automating tasks. Anything to add there, Mary? Does that give you any any food for thought when you you know when you think back around some of the challenges you had in uh, in that space with different systems you had? I mean, it really does. The biggest problem that I always had with integrations is someone would always say, hey, we've got this brand new technology. We've got this brand new system. Um, we're going to just in, we're going to implement it. It's going to be great. But then that integration would never fully get done. You know, for whatever reason, they uh, whether it was a tech fall apart or insert 100 million reasons we've all heard here of like, oh, well, we got it 80% of the way, so it's good enough. But also, it's not doing what it's supposed to be. It's like, why would you, it's like, why would you pay your internet provider to only cover you 80% of the time? So if you are paying for a service, and no matter how complicated it is, or whatever, like, really don't let it drop that it's that you haven't fully integrated because there's been systems that I've worked with that I said, oh, this would be really helpful for me to use. I would love to use this. And they said, oh, it's not was not integrated. Okay, well, why not? Oh, well, we ran into a tech issue. And so that's where the in the research stage of, you know, finding that technology and that solution, you know, really drilling down into that, like doing your homework, because of course, the salespeople are going to sell you everything, they're going to sell you the dream. And it's great. And that mm -hmm. they are going to solve a lot of your problems, but making sure you have that compatibility, what especially if you have more of a legacy system, that's a homegrown one. I would definitely do your homework to make sure that that's something that can even be accomplished because otherwise you only have 80% of a solution. And I'll give you a logistics one. That's like someone sending out a truck that hasn't got a lift gate and they end up dropping the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the shipment or the pallet at the end of the driveway. Right. It's, um, it's not really what the customer ordered. <laughs> have fun getting a get thousand pounds into your house by yourself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so just, I guess, finishing off on that, um, and I think it touches on what you just said too, which is the planning piece. So one of the keys we're coming to later on is really how you plan projects. But again, this, I think, sows the seed for that. So before you look at integrations, it's, and again, we will use LTL as the prime example. The, the, the LTL industry is, is very interconnected as much as they compete with each other they also rely on each other to deliver in each of their regions so a lot of the ltl carriers work with each other very closely so when we've sold solutions in the you know our the, the the prospect goes and talks to our current partners right we don't have to tell them who they are they know who they are and they go and ask for like an honest referral of what we can do how good we are it can we do the same things we say we can do and again the systems that are out there that particularly all of the different logistics sectors you know they've been in that space a long time so finding out who they are and getting those referrals from you know even if it's competitors doing uh, it's a, probably a bugbear of someone that works in it is is investing in r d um you know I, I you know it's easy for me to say no company invests enough in r d but there's certainly a lot of carriers out there that i see and and we've been um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say that we've not done this in the past too. Certainly within our operational side of the business, you kind of point and shoot. You, you know, you look, you maybe do an evaluation of three pieces of software or five pieces of software because we haven't got it in the budget to do a small proof of concept with them for three months to see if it actually does what we need it to do. So, you know, if you get the option to do that, if you can negotiate that in the price, um, you, know, uh, you know, to go live for properly, or even if you can pay a small amount to do a proof of value or a proof of concept beforehand, 
um, it goes a long way before you commit to a system that might have a three-year contract on it. Okay, moving on. Number three, prioritizing data visibility. Um, so we've kind of covered the end-to-end -end supply chain and given some examples, I guess, of the world that we're talking about. Now we're really going to kind of get into data, but again, probably keep it fairly vague. So it, it, it hopefully talks to everyone that's uh, on, on this call. Um, the piece I'm going to start with is what is the power or the value of getting data in real time? So um, the key, key from my side is I think that and I think everyone's beholden to this. You'll find this in any industry around the world. Um, I think we accept and don't necessarily challenge what we do. So I'll give you an example in our world. We process a lot a lot of bills of lading for our, for our clients. And traditionally, until we started investing in technology stacks because we took a real fresh look at what we do, and we realized that we were potentially part of the problem. Because what used to happen is the driver got back to the dock, and the and then the bill of lading uh, would go into the terminal someone in the back office would do the sort which i know you're very familiar with get rid of all of the staples put it through a feed scanner they'd send it to our our, our keyers if we're doing it manually in say the philippines right so the philippines works really well because there's an eight hour time difference so their day is the us night so that works really well but we don't get those bills back, or historically we didn't get those bills back to the carrier till the next morning. And five years ago, 10 years ago, that was fine. They were good with that. It was a cheap alternative to getting a really labor intensive task dealt with, right? And there are still clients that we do that for today. Um, the chat about earlier about the expectation of people. Imagine there's a lot of people that come into the logistics world at young age now, at maybe 18, 20, 25, whatever the age goes, and they've had they've had their own experience as a customer with with freight, right? And they've had their own experience with things like Lyft and Uber, where you can now track your cab and you you know where it is at all times, you know where it's taking you. So the expectation within freight is 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 moving in that direction. And I'd imagine there's a lot of people coming into our industry that are then very disappointed because it's not where it should be. It's probably a good way to well to, to put it. Would you agree, Mary? Or yeah, I'm assuming I'm assuming you saw those frustrations. Absolutely. It's really frustrating when, you know, you're dealing with a shipping manager or something for a customer and they hit you. I can't tell you how many times I've been hit with, well, I can track my Amazon package. Why can't I track this shipment? And it's fundamentally different, but still it raises a great point of, you know, there is up until honestly, a couple of years ago, there was that, there was that huge hole in tracking in data visibility and other stuff like that. But I think now that technology has kind of caught up. Uh, I like to think that trucking and supply chains kind of going through this technology revolution, if you will, uh, where we're finally getting that technology, those upgrades, kind of that, that lift that we've desperately needed to move away from faxing side to be a wells um because we don't we don't need to be faxing things but i think also you know uh, some of the issues that we ran into specifically with BOLs is that, you know, drivers, they don't have scanners on the road. They either have to wait for the warehouse to do it or they have to go to a UPS store and do it. Um, I think a lot of those apps that uh, different brokerages are using or digital freight matching apps, they have that thing where drivers can just take their smartphone, take a picture of the BOL, and that automatically sends it in and that automatically gets input in. I mean, it's you're always going to have to have at least like one to two people to do um, some manual keying just for the working the exceptions, if you will, because you can't automate everything 100%. You're still going to have those exceptions and you're going to need people to work those exceptions. But that's a lot easier than having maybe six to seven people just doing nothing but keying invoices all day. Um, I think it's a much better use of time and resources to really just use that manpower on those exceptions and those weird ones. So a question for you, what would, so we go back to, we'll stay on this example, because obviously we, we do have a solution that we brought in, which I'll touch on in a second, although I'm not a salesperson. The, but before I do that, what's the power of getting the data in real time in any scenario? So not necessarily here, but you know, if you've got the data as soon as something's happened, what, what do you think you could do with that? So maybe pick a scenario and. 
I think honestly, it lets you. I think it lets you make faster decisions. So, for example, if I know that this with this fall, September and October is supposed to be one of the worst hurricane seasons on record. So if I'm able to pull up my dashboard as a shipper, if I'm able to pull up my dashboard and see, okay, well, I'm supposed to have six loads going through the projected path of a hurricane. I'm going to do what I can to either pull those forward, halt or stop those loads from going entirely or encourage those drivers to get the heck out of there. So that way they're not in the path of the storm and neither are my goods and I'm facing potential loss. So I think it really lets you make faster empowered decisions because whether it's, you know, a geopolitical event, weather insert, <clears throat> excuse me, insert reason here. <clears throat> I think it really helps you make those decisions. No, I, I get it. I'll give you time to catch your breath, which is a perfect segue into, into DDC. Um, so I guess this is our example. Um, I'm, I'm going to give some quick context and then we'll, we'll move on. But um, so this is one of the things that we've invested in, in the last five years that we saw where we were a potential uh, block. As I said to you earlier, the solution we provided that worked for our clients that they never questioned. Um, you know, we realized at some point their competition is going to get the, you know, they're going to get the data from the truck um, when, when the driver does the pickup and they're going to want to route that instantly they're going to want to agree a drop time done you know almost as soon as the goods are collected and if they're not doing that or if we're not in the position that we now block them to be able to do that because it's a an eight hour 12 hour turnaround working through the way we did this traditionally we would then become part of the problem so we looked at solutions that were out there there are quite a few and um, none of them were specifically designed they're designed maybe to take a photo of a freight bill um, and to give some key screens for drivers to key in some key information to do the skeleton data. But what we found very quickly was clients were coming to us and say, oh, we've, we, we've been looking at this app. Do you think you'll be able to key the bill if we send you the image and not from the back office? And we tried and we failed. And because this is really the lifeblood of our business, the source image that we need to work from is the most important thing that doesn't then just diminish our service offering to our client so that was really the genesis of what is dbc sync and, and how it's different to what you would is we have a process that intuitively teaches a driver to take a good image where they hold it they're basically told to hold it a certain distance away to allow light optimization and focus and, and all that stuff it also goes through an ocr um, uh, uh, scanner a scan on the device itself so if you've got um, cell signal or not the image will be accepted or rejected in real time. And that's the biggest thing we saw against the other stuff that was out on the market. They hadn't really thought about the rejection rate of those images. But some of the carriers we spoke to were having a rejection rate, or well, most having a rejection rate between 10 and 20%, which means they've got a problem with one in five or one in 10 shipments. And you, know, you were saying earlier about doing 80% of the work. Um, yeah, it doesn't work in a logistics world. You need to be doing 99 point something and that's really how our system stands out differently. We track, I think it's 99.4 across every client that uses that, that service. But it's an example, and we'll move on from that. I think we are now at point four, which is unlocking the power of unstructured data. So structured and unstructured data, what do you know? Because I'd imagine you know quite a bit. Um, I mean, I'm not quite the expert in unstructured versus uh, structured data, but I would say that normally your unstructured data is kind of the raw data that you compile. Is that right? Kind of, but keep going. So I'd say that it's, um, <laughs> I would say that it's kind of that um, the, for lack of a better word, kind of that chaotic mess you get from a shipper when you say, hey, we're doing an RFP for you. We'd love to get maybe three months worth of data. And they just kind of send you a chaotic Excel sheet that you're left to go, okay, we can figure this out. This is, this is fine. We can turn this into something we can send out in an RFP. So you're, you're, you're kind of bang on, but the reality is, is that data was structured from the person that sent it to you because in their world it made sense so again going back to the simple terms because i like to be the school teacher sometimes the um every time you write a sentence or any of us write a sentence it's a structure it's a structure that we can read even if it's my messy scribble on a page 
I can read it, it makes sense to you, to me. It may not make sense to you, depending on how well I write that down or how much time I take to get it correct. The reality is that it did start as a structure. The second it is unreadable, something needs to be done and triggered and changed in order to, for it to take on the next part of the journey. So that then needs to be restructured. So what's really interesting, and I think you're, you're spot on, but again, pulling that back to the supply chain, we've got the piece where it's amazing how in all logistics, how when data passes between parties, right, unless you've built APIs or, in, or, or you know, directly with clients or use middleware to integrate all of these systems, or, you know, you get an EDI message that you've written a map for to be able to ingest that data into your system. Every time you are changing that, be it if it's using uh, an API, you know, you are restructuring. So when we said earlier on about that is restructuring structured data, again, into something you can read, right? And it's amazing when you go from the, from the, from when the shipment's first booked all the way through to the shipments finally invoiced, how many people that data can pass through, how many different systems within that carrier or the multiple carriers in that chain, and how many times that data gets structured or, or restructured um, for the use that's, that's needed. So, and you know, we see it in all forms. We see it in, in you know, EDI messages are one example. The other stuff is the stuff we see in the back office. So, you know, the example you've got on the screen here emails, spreadsheets, PDFs. Yeah, it's, it's all structured data. But if you get an image now on a PDF, someone is probably having to screenshot that and then type that in somewhere to because there is that's the only solution they've been given. Yeah, that's that. Um, I think that that leans more into that. It's the exception. Like you have that automation, you have that rule, but you always get that one that you're like, how do I even begin to process this? Because it's not like nothing is nothing is rendering it correctly and there's nothing that you can even handle. Um, and kind of like when you first find the first few problems, you mentioned all the data going through different systems. Well, when you're sitting there with 200 invoices that didn't rate correctly because one letter is off on an EDI code, then you're sitting there and you're like, okay, well, something was lost in translation and something went wrong throughout the process. And that um, it can, it, when it works, oh buddy, does it work well? And you have a nice well-oiled mm -hmm. machine and everything's going well. But when it goes wrong, that's a very bad day for everyone involved. And it's a great example because in theory, people think that's IT's problem. And, and I would imagine in a lot of uh, businesses, IT can't react as quick as they need to. So quite often there'll be someone smart like yourself that will probably go into the body of the message and try and find where it's gone wrong just because you can't wait because you know your work is mounting up. And that's where you, that's where you learn, uh, you learn to do, you learn fun skills that you would never thought that you would need to read. You would never know that what all the little stuff like, uh, asterisks mean on EDI, raw EDI files. And that's when you end up just sending a note to it of, Hey, here's the problem. Here's the solution. I just don't have access to fix it. If you could do it, that'd be great. Or if you could give me access and that's how you end up getting just enough dangerous access to fix things. <laughs> and then you become a problem to me. That's what, that's what I find. <laughs> Cause I've, I've got those people and they're great until they're not. And then, yeah. and then that causes more pain. And then we go, why did we, why did we allow that? But, yeah. Oh, but Cause like 90% of the time it's great, but that 10%, oh boy, we broke something. Absolutely. So I would say we've got the examples on screen. We're not here to boom feed people. So again, if there's questions coming, we're almost through the six points. Please put your questions in the in, in the comments uh, and we'll get to them because hopefully that's more engaging than us just reading off the, the bullet points that are up on screen. Hopefully you're reading those along with us. And then and now we're on to you know structuring or you know, how to structure uh, unstructured data. So again, this is something that we you spent a lot of time on. So DDC stands for direct data capture. Uh, it's what we do. So yes, we have teams of people that still manually uh, build um, and there's great reasons and examples for that. Um, I used to work uh, in air freight, as I said, I used to do, I've, I've done everything within air freight and I used to work at a, a um, an airside facility. And we, one of the biggest airlines that came through our facility, they just said, when well, this is my first example of outsourcing, they said, 
I said, well, how are we going to get the data into the system? Um, you know, I can do an integration, blah, blah. They said, no, 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 no problem. We're, we're putting on keyers. I can integrate it. No, 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 no. We're, we're going to, we're going to put on keyers. I'm like, but I can integrate it. It does it's not a problem. And they were, and they were like, no, we're concerned about the security aspect. Effectively, they said, we're concerned about the security aspects. We would rather you provide us with your screens and we will provide the billers that will key into uh, into those screens because to protect their reputation as a global airline um, for the for the amount of the volume we were doing for maybe 20 people's work it was in their better interest to have people do the manual work right and so i became quite astute to that maybe 15 20 years ago that you know it is maybe not always the answer to things um, but it should be considered um, but you've got to weigh up the pros and cons, and security is a, is, a, is a key factor to that. But getting back to, I guess, unstructured data and what we do with un what we consider unstructured, a lot of bills of lading, um, and we could just provide billers to do so. And by doing that, um, we would have a really high attrition rate because people will get bored of, of what we do. So what we try to do and what we try to encourage our clients to do is allow us to automate that service where possible. So we have a service um, called Auto, Auto Extraction and Structuring, AES for short. Um, it's an evolution of a product that we brought to market in 2013, which was called DDC Intelligence. Um, and, and what it effectively does is it does an OCR pass on, on, the, on the image or the data that you've produced, and then it goes about structuring. So the, one of the reasons why I thought this was relevant to tell everyone about this today is really the advancements we've seen. So if we go back to when we had DDC intelligence, it was heavily what we call templated, which means it was based on location-based information. So if, you're in, if you work in a, a finance department and you've only got 200 suppliers um, and you're going to get exactly the same invoice from them right you can template the 200 invoice types that you get and you know where the details are on that page within reason that you need to capture and in that example templating is 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 really powerful and can get you an awful lot of data and remove a lot of the keying work the challenge that we had again specifically going back to ltpl is the frequency or, or the, the lack of frequency in seeing the same freight bill every time. Um, we actually do, we do some dip tests and some samples with our clients. Often when we onboard into the service, we take them for a proof of value. So we process for the bigger ones, we process, let's say a hundred thousand bowls and we start with like a thousand a day. We ramp up to like two, 2,600 and then we go to 8,000. When we get to the 8,000 in the last week with them, about 60% of that 8,000 bill, bill run that we have is, is a single bill. We've not seen a second bill exactly the same. It staggers me that the US is that big. All right, so I'm not saying we don't see the same bill the following Monday, that ABC carpet manufacturer isn't saying, sending the same goods every Monday. But whenever we do a dip test on a single day run, we really see 60% of the time, you don't see the same bill twice. Would you agree? Oh, 100%. Is, is especially that your experience when you... I would say 100%, especially if you're talking about your your LTL shipments, they get weird, they get crazy. And there's just the sheer volume of things that has to move is staggering. It is staggering. And also every carrier has a different way they like to do their BOLs. Some are easier to read, some aren't. It's just, it is what it is. It's, it's kind of chaotic, but it works. <laughs> so I'm conscious of time. So um, yeah, so I guess with that AES service, I mean, that's really what we've cracked is the ability to, to structure unstructured data. Without seeing the same bill ever before, we can get a very high level of extraction. So if we can do it, you know, um, it, it's achievable for whatever process you're, you, you need to do. So moving on quickly, because of time, I guess 0.5, these next two will get through fairly quickly, I think. So in the, in the white paper, it covered uh, routine freight audits. I'm, I'm gonna widen that field slightly and just say, routine audits of anything. Um, and it re it's really gonna tie into the sixth point as well, which is setting up an IT program. To me, data is key. So any of the things that we're talking about today, people can have great ideas about the things they want to do to get the business to back you, especially if you're gonna make changes in a effectively what's a 24 hour operation, which is sometimes challenging. Um, you need data to prove it. So being able to do an audit of anything, you know, that's a time in motion exercise of how long it 
its ability to complete a bill, for example, or, or, or rating, or how long it takes for you know goods to move through the warehouse, whatever it is. And that's just examples of time in motion exercise, good data that really back up the fact that if we make this change, there will be a return on investment. Anything you would add to that? Or? I would say do not sleep on the rate audits. They are very important. They are extremely crucial. Uh, we had a customer that we implemented a rate audit on them. And in the first month alone, we think I think we saved them, what, like $10,000 on just just one month's worth of freight bills because they were just blindly pay paying everything that came in. And we came through and said, hey, you know, we're gonna double check that these assets oil charges are valid because carriers would put residential delivery on something that was not a residential. And so we would just go through and double check those. And at first, yes, it is very manual. It takes a lot of time. But once you kind of figure out what common ones you're seeing and different things, you can build that automated solution that doesn't necessarily have to be, oh, here's a $2 million a year subscription to this very fancy technology. It can be something much easier than that. Um, but ultimately, it'll pay for itself in the long term because I think we hired someone to do it. Um, and that person paid for their salary in the first like six or seven months because of how many errors they were finding and how much money we had saved that customer. And then we were able to expand it out and it ended up saving an obscene amount of money and just freight bill corrections. That's not even like going further down. And I would just say, no matter what, even if it's full truckload, LTL, anything, just do a freight audit because it will end up working out in your favor. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Okay, let's bring it full circle. Planning ahead for technology rollout. So we're now into my actual speciality, apparently. So uh, I'm going to start with the biggest key, communication. Um, you know, we touched earlier about planning and what you could do or the investment you could make in R&D before you make a commitment to a project or, or rollout. But it really goes back for me a stage further than that. Uh, whatever it is you're going to do, unfortunately, you need to over communicate it to everyone. Um, taking everyone involved on the journey is is key. Otherwise, you will come against roadblocks or people will lose enthusiasm along the way. These are all the reasons why IT projects fail, uh, in my opinion. Um, a really good example, imagine most IT departments do it now, but again, to make you know, a wider audience aware, doing like a project racy, you know, even taking an hour to sit there and just do a, a, a project racy of what you think you need to do, however big or small you think that project is, identifying who the stakeholders are, so the ones that you need to, um, that, that are going to be responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. When you start to do that list out, when that stakeholder list gets quite long, even when you're trying to make the smallest change in IT, when you realize that all these people need to be consulted or informed, actually this has become quite a complex problem or challenge to solve even if the it problem is easy to fix so one of the mistakes it people make is they come at things very logically and it makes perfect sense i think logistics this is a great example where practicality um wins out every time and that often pops a lot I would definitely say just to add something very quickly is, you know, have that change management, get those people that you know are going to say, well, we've always done it this way. We're always going to continue to do it that way. Get those change management people, get them involved early so that way they see why you're doing it and you have a plan to roll it out. Because if you get some of those more stubborn people on board early, it's only going to make it that much easier when you go to actually roll it out and you have a strong change management plan. And I think I think that's key. I mean, you, you've got to have a strong plan up front and a really clean vision of what it looks like. And then it's like you've got to follow that out throughout the whole of it. So you've got the examples on here. We've already touched better communication, but ample testing. If that's even in R and D before you've started and you make that first phase, do that. Um, efficient training. So again, make sure people know why they're doing something uh, and not just tell them to do it. And then again, being flexible, I'm going to say, I say within, with adoption, I'm not even just going to say it's, it's, it's about that. There has to be a level of flexibility that if things go wrong, you need to be able to pivot. Otherwise, you end up with a broken system. 100%. So, well, we have we're about. Up. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go for it. I think that's it. I think we've covered a successful rollout. And we, we're recapping, I guess, the, the six points.
if you feel free to take take it home. Well, I was going to say we have about 10 minutes left, so I was going to move on to some Q&A. For anyone else that has some questions, make sure to type them into the Q&A box, and we'll get through as many as we can because we want to hear from you guys. We want to see any problems that you've had or solutions or any kind of advice. Um, so I'll start with the first one here, Richard. Does DDC work with any client system? They work with Microsoft Access 2013. Yes. So when you say DDC, I mean, we work with any provider, you know, because we provide technical and manual uh, solutions. But if we're talking specifically about AES, we, we design it specifically kind of like we were saying earlier about middleware, about uh, being um, loosely coupled. So how that would work is if, say, it was bills of lading that you need to process, ideally, you would provide us with that access to an SFTP site, we collect the images and we push the data back in whatever format you need. So in that case, we, we act as the middleware provider and ingest that data back into your system. Um, but and it tends to require very little, if any, integration on the carrier side. I like that. You guys just slide in to any kind of solution. It's, it, it's, it's actually one of the fundamentals of our business. So it could say we've been in business since 89 and it's we, 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 we're not there to tell cu customers or clients how to do their job. We're there for them to tell us how we can help. And we've always done that, even from the manual stuff we do. You know, the client trains us on their processes and their systems. So when we've then started developing technology, we've taken that same ethos through because we shouldn't be telling people, you've got to change your system, you've got to do that. We try to create the glue that allows you to do what you're good at. I like that. That's a really nice approach. Um, so what is the implementation timeline for this technology from the time the contract is signed to full operational stage? What do you expect to see during that? Is it kind of like a three month, six month? What kind of timeline are we working with? Um, we tend to do, it's interesting everyone's picking on the AES piece, but okay, um, for, for bigger clients, um, or for all clients, depending on size, I would suggest doing a proof of value first. It's kind of what we were saying earlier about do your R&D, make sure it works for you, and make sure you really get an understanding. So when we do that with like bigger national carriers, as I said earlier, we do about a base, base sample run of about 100,000 bills, um, and we ramp up throughout the period, and we show them what the levels of extraction they're going to get. And what we try to do is mirror the live operation so they'll have some idea of what that will look like when we integrate it, as far as integration, it can be very quick and simple. The, the restrictions aren't really on our side, they're more on the client side. And you know that's where we need to get into a discovery to see what if you're still using AS400 um, and if there's challenges there that would prevent us using our out of the box. So have you, this is, I, I just have a thought, would it, um, so if I'm a, carrier or a shipper or someone looking to implement a solution, whether it's um, automation or anything that we've talked about today, you've mentioned a few times, like having them show a proof of concept or dive a little bit deeper. Are there any, mm -hmm. like, is that like a red flag if someone's not willing to do that from like, uh, when I'm looking for a partner, should that be considered a red flag if they're not willing to go that far? No, because I, I can understand that people, as, this, as we said earlier, like people are watching their, their what I would call pennies, your sense. Um, and, you know, and, and it's, you know, certainly with smaller businesses, um, they've made the commitment, they get the idea, they've got faith in the team that we're going to deliver what we say we're going to do. So they just want to get on and do it. M my error of caution, this is me not being a salesperson, but being an IT person, I would, I would, Bear on the, the the side of doing some kind of proof, um, even if it's small, just so that you know it's really clean that you you know you know what you expect and what you're going to get, and just take the time to do it. Same as I was saying earlier about doing a racy, you know, people get excited and jump straight into a project. Unfortunately, I dump into process, and and I, I want to start with my racy, and as much as that might take me an hour longer than everyone else, it will save time down the line. I like that. That kind of, it goes back into having a good plan because you're only as strong as that plan and how quickly you can adapt to it. Um, that is that miss it twice cut once, but I get, especially in logistics, that there's not always time to do that. So you've got to be flexible and, uh, and balance it. A hundred percent. So someone else asked, what's the best strategy performing 
for performing a freight invoice audit when you're working with a high volume of invoices. Also from another AS400 user. What's up? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw that at you. I think you should answer that. I mean, it really depends, obviously. So you want to, the, the best way that I have found to start is start with one customer and one carrier pairing. Figure it out, work through some of those complex problems that you have, um, because once you get it, once you kind of get the very beginning of the, of the flow down, starting with one carrier and one customer combo makes it very manageable. You can pick a, a medium sized one, if you will. So I think when, when we started, we did one that had maybe 20 to 30 invoices a week. Um, for just that one customer carrier pairing. Um, it was it was a medium shipper, there were more or less, but anyway, we chose that one and um, it really lent itself, ni itself nicely because we saw a wide variety of problems. We were able to kind of get that all sorted out. And then as we got more comfortable and established a process, then we started adding on more carriers to that customer. And so once we got that whole customer um, online and we had a process worked out for them, we moved to the next customer. Most of it stayed the same, but we would just tweak based off each customer. And that really came down to that customer's requirements. So it was something like, um, we did, uh, like some customers were, if it was within, if it was anything less than a penny off, they, they wanted to know why they needed to know what it was. Some people were like, eh, as long as it's within $5, we don't care. So it really just depends on that level of like what that customer wants. Um, and honestly it, I've done it with a annual, with a manual, like process in AS 400, it's not fun. Um, but that is where I would almost recommend getting like a, a, a service or get something that lets you get that, get a little bit more user-friendly just because AS 400 is not the most user-friendly in the world when you're trying to make corrections. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw, I'll throw onto that very quickly because I know we want to try and get through some more questions, but the, I would say time and motion. So like we were saying earlier about auditing, finding a way which is challenging in AS400 because it often doesn't track how long it's been spent on a shipment because it wasn't yeah. thought of when the systems were created. But being able to track how long things take, that's how you could then track the improvement. So whatever you change, if you the, 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 the audit, the time and motion audit tells you if what you're doing is better or worse, if it gets quicker. What we do, we, we, have, we process something like 300,000 transactions a night um, through our service centers specifically in logistics um every every second to us is 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 time and money to us and our clients um so you know we we really try to maximize that and we use technology to do it so our smart qa screens once it's gone through like our extraction process we uh we often if we can validate that data against client lookup tables or historical data we will try to validate a lot of those screens so that when the billers look at it they don't have to look at certain fields they only have to look at the ones that are incomplete you know so those are things that we've worked on over the last 30 years to really get the time savings down yeah, and I think it really goes into how can you work it into your own individual process. And if you don't have a process, then fantastic. You get to start with nothing and you get to try all these different avenues to figure out what's best with you. Because like you had mentioned earlier, some of the trap that people fall into is that, oh, we have always done it this way, so we're going to continue doing it this way. Whereas if you have a new approach, you truly do get to find out what works best for you. And you don't have to do it just because we've done it like that for 10 years. Blank canvas is absolutely awesome. That's a really good place to start. Yeah, it's terrifying and exciting in the best way. Um, but I think we are just about out of time. So I'm gonna hand it over to Emily to close it out. Excellent. Yes, as Mary said, that is all the time that we do have for today. Thank you to everyone again for taking the time to listen in. And a big thank you to Richard and Mary for sharing your insight with us today. As a reminder, the recording of this webinar will be sent to you tomorrow via the email you used to register with. We hope you'll join us again for our next Freight Waves webinar. Thanks, everyone.